I boarded an almost empty city bus, dropped my coins into the proper place, and observed the passengers aboard, only two, a white woman who sat in the third row from the front and a black man in a seat near the back. I took the fifth row seat from the front and sat down, immediately closing my eyes and envisioning in my mind's eye the wonderful two weeks vacation I would have with my family and friends in Ohio. From the far distance of my reverie, I thought I heard a voice, an unpleasant voice, but I was too happy to worry about voices or any noise for that matter. But the same words were repeated in a stronger, unsavory tone, and I opened my eyes. Immediately, I sat up in that seat. The bus driver had stopped the bus, turned in the seat, and was speaking to me. If you can sit in the fifth row from the back of the other buses in Montgomery, suppose you get up, get off, and ride in one of them. I heard him, but the message did not register with me. My thoughts were elsewhere. I had not even noticed that the bus had come to a full stop, or I had subconsciously surmised that passengers were getting on or off. Suddenly, the driver left his seat and stood over me. His hand was drawn back as if he were going to strike me. Get up from there, he yelled. He repeated it. For days, I had not moved. Get up from there! I leapt to my feet, afraid that he would hit me, and ran to the front door to get off of the bus. I even stepped down to the lower level so that when the door was open, I could step off the bus and hide myself, for tears were falling rapidly from my eyes. It suddenly occurred to me that I was supposed to go to the back door to get off, not the front. However, I was too upset, frightened, and tearful to move. I never could have walked to that rear door. Then the driver opened the front door, and I stumbled off the bus and started walking back to the college. Tears blinded my vision. Waves of humiliation inundated me. And I thank God that none of my students were on that bus to witness that tragic experience. I could have died from embarrassment. Joe Ann Gibson Robinson, December 1949. In the 1950s, segregation was the law of the land in the United States. Each and every day, African Americans were faced with discrimination and humiliation at work, school, and even on street corners. From what we know in terms of the, uh, uh, the energy you know, that went into the boycott that really fanned the flames of dissent uh, and brought people together in ways they hadn't been brought together before with Rosa, was, you know, Rosa Parks, uh, her refusal to uh, uh, acquiesce, you know, to a male's demand, the white male's demand that she get up and get her seat up, which was uh, one of the ways that whites demeaned uh, people of African descent, and this was especially demeaning to uh, African American women because uh, the, the buses were the primary means of transportation of people in the African-American community, and especially domestics, black domestics. Uh, and so uh, to, to be told that, they, that uh, uh, black domestic working all day in white people's homes, uh, to be told that even after a long day of toiling and work, that one could not uh, even have a seat on the bus if white people got on uh, in, that, uh, in the area and enough white people got on that black people had to simply get up and give their seats up was a very demeaning thing and a humanizing thing. For many of the black people who lived in Montgomery, Alabama, the public bus was the place in which they experienced racial discrimination at its worst. After Rosa Parks, a secretary for the NAACP, was arrested for refusing to give up her seat to a white man on December the 1st, 1955, the black leaders in Montgomery decided that it was the opportune time to boycott the buses. Although the public figures for the boycott were all African-American males, the women were the key components to a success. College professor and president of the Women's Political Council, Joe N. Gibson Robinson, was instrumental in the planning and the implementation of the boycott. Because she had first-hand experience of the humiliation and degradation of segregation on the public buses, Gibson vowed to make a change. During the Montgomery bus boycott, she and the Women's Political Council worked endlessly to make sure that segregation on buses would be outlawed. Well, as you know, women were quite African-American women were quite influential in the Montgomery bus boycott. 
um, part of what was, I think, so important for the African American women who participated, but also later when the NAACP became involved, was to um, project a, a kind of image about the participants. Um, Joanne Robinson, for example, even though she was divorced, always went by Mrs. Robinson. It was important for her to project um, an image of respectability. Uh, same with same with Rosa Parks, right? There were reasons why Rosa Parks was um, became involved um, and became the linchpin around whom the um, the movement the movement centered. Um, there were other cases when African American women were asked to um, to give up their seats to white patrons, and in fact, an earlier case involved uh, a, a young African American woman named Claudette Colvin, I believe was her name. And um, she was younger, unmarried, had, um, I believe she was pregnant. If she wasn't pregnant, she was certainly um, had, um, let's shall we say, shady past. And uh, folks who were involved in the movement decided that she perhaps wouldn't be the best person around him to center this movement. Rosa Parks' character was unassailable unimpeachable. She was, um, she was an active member in her community, but also her character was stellar. And so that was important in terms of, in terms of gaining outside, outside support. Hours after Rosa Parks' arrest, Robinson called up the other members of the Women's Political Council and began to plan the boycott. Robinson not only took part in making the 35,000 copies of leaflets that would announce the boycott, she also worked all night and well into the morning to make sure that the announcements made it to the designated places. She and the other members of the Women's Political Council also volunteered their cars during the boycott. In terms of, um, in terms of de developing and sustaining the movement, ordinary um, working class African American women proved in many ways to be the backbone. They were the ones who could sustain the bus boycott. They were the ones who needed to ride the buses to work and who refused to ride the buses to work. And a boycott only works as long as its participants are willing to continue, right? As soon as that breaks down, the boycott fails. Um, so that was an important aspect, their, their willingness to, to sustain the movement. Although the bus boycott was only supposed to last one day, it ended up lasting 13 months. There were nightly church meetings to keep the people motivated. Although many people's houses were bombed and others were threatened, the black community of Montgomery stayed true to the cause and no one rode the buses for that whole year. The Montgomery bus boycott ended with the December 1956 U.S. Supreme Court ruling that city bus segregation was unconstitutional. I mean, in our collective memory, Rosa Parks looms large. It's the event that catapults. Um, it's the event that catapults um, Martin Luther King Jr. to the forefront of civil rights. But it's in women um, like Joanne Robinson and, and the other sort of ordinary, everyday women who made that boycott successful. Keep on a walking, keep on a talking, and marching up to freedom there. Hang on, or let no one for come on, Lord. Turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Hang on, or let no one for come on, Lord. Turn me round, keep on a walking, keep on a talking, and marching up to freedom there. Hang on, or let nobody, Lord. Turn me round. Keep on a talking, yeah, marching up to freedom. Yeah.